Now, leadership is and always has been one of the most challenging requirements in any business. And there is the saying in any organization or team, leadership is always the problem and the solution. And especially over the last two years, it has forced us to rethink what leadership looks like because we live in a more complex and more rapidly changing workforce and workplace than we've ever been. From flatter hierarchies where we can't necessarily rely on tenure and years of experience to progress in our role and get more information and with that the title to having a more competitive landscape thanks to technology to also shifting consumer behaviors and the rise of the gig economy the great resignation and everything in between now today we're joined by someone who's made it his mission to improve the quality of leaders globally marty moore marty thank you so much for being here hi petra it's fantastic to join you i've been really looking forward to this interview Oh, and me too, because you are one of those few people who don't just talk the talk, but you walk the walk. <laughs> and you have been living and leading, by example, in so many different aspects, which we will cover in a second. You've gone from being a university dropout to becoming a CEO of a multi-million dollar business, from having the corporate career to now running your own business with your daughter, to starting in software engineering of all the industries and professions, to now teaching leaders what leadership is all about. And most recently, Recently, you're now known for your no bullshit leadership approach from your programs to your podcast, which has over um, is released in over 100 countries and now your best selling book, No Bullshit um, Leadership. Now, I'm super curious, where is this drive for this no bullshit leadership coming from? Well, let me take this one in two parts, Petra, because um, even though I love simplifying things, this one isn't quite a simple answer. <laughs> The, the first drive was the drive to actually do something different from being the corporate executive. And I think that drive came because I realized a number of years ago that I simply wanted to have more impact. And what I realized was that if I was leading uh, even the largest organization in Australia or a big Fortune 500 company, I was really only going to directly impact maybe 100 people directly, and 50 of those didn't even want to be impacted. <laughs> So, so I realized that I wanted to do something more to have a broader reach and to do more with my life and certainly who I could influence in the world, uh, thus going in and setting up this business. So here we are a few years down the track and, you know, over 2 million downloads of the podcast, um, thousands of students have, have been through our programs. I mean, it's just the opportunity to fundamentally change the way people lead. And so when we started with our purpose, which was to improve the quality of leaders globally, um, that sounded very ambitious, but it's absolutely realistic uh, because technology makes it so. So the first part was about that drive to actually do something more. The no bullshit leadership piece comes from the fact that I was actually quite frustrated that the whole dialogue and discourse about leadership had really devolved into a fluffy, aspirational conversation. And for me, it was actually quite frustrating because Yes, the things that we talk about in terms of desirable leadership attributes, like humility and transparency and integrity and those sorts of things, they're all important. But there was no practical guide. There was no roadmap as to how you might be able to do that. So if, for example, I decided I wanted to be more humble, don't laugh. If I decided I wanted to be more humble, where would I start? What steps would I take? What are the disciplines I'd need? What are the habits I'd need to, to master to be able to do this? And so what I'm doing with No Bullshit Leadership is just reconnecting the process and profession of leadership with the need to achieve results and deliver value. And that's it. So I'm putting it back together as, okay, all this, all this aspirational stuff, this virtue signaling stuff, all well and good, nothing wrong with it, and very desirable, but most leaders listen to it, they aspire to it, and then they do absolutely nothing. And so when you talk to their teams about how they are as leaders, they get really, really poor reviews. So I think that was those dual drivers of wanting to have more impact and also wanting to get something much more practical into the world about how to lead better. I'm so glad you mentioned that uh, in terms of practicality, because you're so right. There are a gazillion leadership programs out there and everyone says, uh, you know, how to have difficult conversations, which obviously is one part to the piece, but it's a lot of fluff around there. And in the end, it needs to be connected with results, because otherwise we don't stay in business for very long if yeah, we absolutely. don't connect it. Yeah. Um, and in terms of 
the change that you've seen? You've obviously been in leadership roles for quite some time and probably in the last you know, two to five years, we've seen more changes than in the last 20 or 30 years. Where have you seen the biggest changes uh, coming in and how have you adjusted to them? Well, I think the obvious things are around um, technology acceleration. Uh, I think that's been obvious. Um, industries come and go, they wax and wane. And so that's always going to be the case. Um, but I think in terms of leadership, leadership is really a constant. And I firmly maintain that if you were a really good leader before 2020, before the pandemic hit, then you're going to be a great leader in 2022 and 2023 and beyond. And the reason for that is because leadership is about people. And leadership drives culture, culture drives performance. And so if you want your business to perform, the only way that's going to happen is if you have a leader who's prepared to be committed and dedicated and diligent enough to lead those people forward, not to just sit around and try and make them all happy, but to actually stretch them and to help them grow and to learn and develop and to perform better. Uh, and so I think, you know, great leaders are always great leaders. It's an absolute constant. The context is becoming harder. Mm. So if you weren't a great leader in 2019, well, you are shit out of luck now because it's much, much harder when you've got people working remotely. Mm. Um, you can't manage by inputs anymore. You can't just uh, measure things like time at the desk, not that that's ever been any sort of indication of value or results, but uh, a lot of managers used to do that. And so I think leading in today's world is more complex and more difficult. The level of ambiguity is higher. The complexity is greater. And so if you were already a great leader, happy days. If you're not, you got some catch up to play. Absolutely. And you, you mentioned the input and the hours are not necessarily a, um, a metric to measure success. And I remember, I mean, I was on the incorporate world for 15 years in the grand scheme of things, it's nothing. But my very first job with Unilever, my general manager came in every night at 7.30 and looked who of the assistant brand managers were still here. And I made the mistake that I left at six o'clock for my first two days. And I had a big speech on the third day saying, if I do that again the next day, I don't need to come back anymore. And you know, <laughs> if you throw that out these days, you could sue them probably. And I'm like, oh my God. And we started at seven o'clock. So for a junior yeah. straight out of uni, it's a big day. <laughs> and, oh, absolutely. You know, yeah. that was, you know, not even 20 years ago. And nowadays it's a lot more inclusive. It's a lot more complex also in terms of building global teams. Everyone's got a different cultural background. It's hard to keep up with the pace of change. And you've transitioned so many times also in terms of the professions that you've been in. What's been your secret to success to get there? Well, I think in terms of transitioning, my, my steps haven't been too radical until my most recent one into the land of, you know, <laughs> micro business and entrepreneurship. Um, most of my transitions came in the corporate world. And the way the best moves happen is that you can establish yourself in an organization as a high performer. Now, I was able to do that a number of times. And when I demonstrated what I was good at in the particular role I was in, then the people around me could imagine me doing other things. And because I had a really good base skill set in terms of the generic business skills, you know, commercial acumen, communication skills, negotiation capability, these types of things, they're common across so many different types of roles. And so um, I'm the sort of person that does seek challenges and get bored easily. I, I'm very, very change resilient. I love change. And so uh, every couple of years, I'm thinking to myself, okay, what's next? I've sort of done this, what's next? And if my employers were interested in keeping me, they had to get creative about finding another role. And so this is why I was able to transition between you know, the world of uh, project management in software development, to being a CIO, to then going to um, a CFO role, to being a head of strategy, and to being a head of sales and marketing. And these are, these are very, very different roles. They're very different job families, but the common elements are surprisingly similar. And if I have one superpower, Petra, it's probably being able to see consistency in patterns. I've actually got good abstract reasoning capability. So I can see context and patterns easily, and I can adapt from one context to another very quickly. And so that's held me in good stead for most of my career. Um, and uh, I've also been able to go across a number of different industries. So as an executive in mining, insurance, uh, uh, rail transportation, and energy. 
And my first job in the energy sector was as chief executive of a multi-billion dollar company. So sort of interesting, right? <laughs> to walk in there and to have an executive team that looked at you and go, mate, you don't know anything about energy, which was absolutely true. And I said, that's why I'm paying you guys. <laughs> and over time, you're going to find out why they have hired me because the board brought me in for a reason. And you'll find out that I'm going to add some value to this business. But it's not because I know the industry back to front. That's a really um, important distinction that you make. And also in one of your podcast interviews that I listened to, you said, I was always the translator. And you basically connected two different departments or needs and demand together. And this resonates with me so much because the professionals I'm working with, they're transitioning usually from being the technical expert and being rewarded for the doing, for the technical know-how to eventually get other people to be and do their very best. And it's not just by knowing more, but being able to connect those dots. Have you always had the superpower or is there some exercise or some practicality how we can actually improve the connecting of dots approach? Um, have I always had it? Probably. I think I've probably learned <laughs> as I've got older to utilize it much better and much more effectively, which I think mm -hmm. is good as, as we all do with age, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and if we're learning constantly, then we'll always be looking for ways that we can do what we're doing better. And, and one thing that I've got really deeply in my psyche that I've had since you know, my, my earliest years that I can remember is this desire to constantly be getting better, constantly improving, constantly changing and doing different things and doing better than I was the day before. And that's been a part of me for a long time. So I guess with any of these skills and capabilities, if you take that approach of being curious and uh, countenancing the possibility that what I think at the moment may not actually be true or may not be the best way to do something, then there are opportunities everywhere for development and improvement. And so I think that's really what's driven it, driven me to sort of hone those skills over time. Mm, absolutely. And speaking of skills, what skill sets would you say is critical to develop further if we want to either progress in a leadership role in terms of a people management, but also in your own capabilities to lead yourself as a business owner, as a board director, as an individual contributor? Well, it's funny you should mention that, Petra. I've just written a book on this, and it's a Wall Street <laughs> Journal bestseller. <laughs> the, I, mean, I mean, leadership leadership is the most fascinating of subjects just because um, there are so many permutations and combinations of human interaction and relationship. And really what you're trying to do, ultimately, is get the best performance you possibly can out of every individual who works for you, and they're all different, in a way that also helps them develop and satisfies them. And so to do that, there are a number of imperatives that I have that I talk about, that the things that you need to do to lead successfully. And, and they are imperatives like, okay, you've got to learn how to deliver value. You've got to be able to strip away all the non-value adding activity and only focus on the things that are going to drive the greatest value for you. And of course, value comes in all sorts of different shapes and sizes. We're not just talking about financial value. It could be you know, providing a safer environment for your employees. It could be getting better market intelligence on your customers and competitors. It could be a, a whole range of things that can create value. Um, if you're a doctor running a surgical practice, value might come in the form of better post-operative outcomes for your patients. So for a leader, it's about understanding profoundly what it is that drives value for your business and then going after only that, not doing anything else, not doing any of the extraneous stuff that just sucks up resources, not, not falling into the trap of just going through the rusted that your organization has you know, traditionally done, but to really drive through to the value. And then, of course, there are a whole range of other things that you need to do, like you know, learn how to handle conflict. And I would say that that's probably the number one career killer that I see is people being conflict averse and not being able to have difficult conversations. It, it just it stops you from doing almost everything as a leader. You can't negotiate successfully. You can't build a high performing team. You can't probably even contribute successfully in group forums if you can't handle conflict because almost everything a leader does has that potential. So there's a whole range of things like this. Um, and uh, I won't go through all of the seven imperatives that I have in the <laughs> no bullshit leadership framework, but you get the picture. It's about, you know, leadership is about who you are, 
what you do in terms of your disciplines and habits and forcing yourself to overcome that natural need to be liked and accepted and to instead seek respect before popularity and go down the path that is best for the organisation and the team rather than following your own narrow self-interest. Mm, that's such an important point to make. And, you know, hardly anyone enjoys the hard conversation, especially if we get rejection, if we get um, negative comments and everyone wants to be liked. But you're right, as a leader, it's not your job to be liked. It's doing the right thing for the organization and for the wider team. And I'm also really fascinated by your journey in the last two, three, four years that you went out and became a lot more public and you build your brand and profile on social media. And also we just talked about uh, your daughter, Emma. She's been a very instrumental part in doing this. And still so many leaders in, um, you know, we, similar to your background, they are scared of that. They don't want to put themselves out there because they could face some negative feedback publicly. Where do you see the importance of having a personal brand as a leader in this day and age, is it an imperative or is it a nice to have or is it, um, what's your insights on that? Well, I think everyone has a personal brand. Um, some are just conscious and deliberate about it and most aren't. Mm. Uh, so every leader has a brand. You just go and talk to the people who work for them. They'll tell you what they're like. They'll tell you whether they're good to work for, whether they're good under pressure, uh, whether they're capable, whether they're good decision makers, whether they procrastinate. They'll tell you all these things and that is the leader's brand. So we all have one. Um, I think since setting up this business, so we've been a bit more deliberate about building the brand that is really consistent and speaks to what it is that we do and what it is we offer. So um, I'm, I'm fascinated by branding generally. Um, I love seeing the way brands like, you know, Nike and Starbucks and these really well-known brands, Disney. I, I just love the way they use the power of their brand that's been earned over decades uh, that gives them a certain perception in the market. And, and the brands can be valued monetarily. So I'm fascinated by, by brands and how they operate. Um, but I think the most important thing about a brand from my perspective is that it has to be really indicative and consistent with who I am, with the message I'm getting out there and with what it is I do. So the no bullshit leadership brand, it's pretty straightforward. Like we will, we will, we will deselect and screen out a bunch of people right from the word go. They'll look at that title and they'll go, oh, that's not for me. That's rude. And they, and they won't go any further. Other people will go, wow, that's catchy. I might have a look at it. And mm. so they'll take that next step. And then when they get into the brand, when they start to sample our content and see the things that we're putting on social media, that's all got to speak exactly the same way in exactly the same voice. Now, of course, with, you know, with me, Emma, of course, does most of the social media stuff. Uh, we've got a, a team of people in Sydney, Australia, who do a bunch of the work and you know, put together you know, ads for social media and things like that. All of this has to be absolutely consistent with the brand that we're trying to create with my personal brand, Martin G. Moore, um, that obviously the book was released under, and also the Your CEO Mental brand, which has all of the products like our podcast and everything else. Absolutely. And this is also, in the end, what builds trust, especially now in this digital first world. Most first interactions and with that, the first impressions usually happen online. And you're, you're very true when you say everyone's got a personal brand, some are intentional about it, and some let other people control what they say about them. Um, and uh, there are also multiple studies that show that especially the younger generation of talents are drawn to leaders who've got a strong presence, who are part of the community, who are starting and contributing to conversations online. Um, how do you see in terms of building trust long term and um, being part of the whole great resignation and war for talent conversation? What's the way to go to attract the best talents and then obviously to keep them? Well, attracting the best talent, once again, uh, I think that comes from being really deliberate about what your brand is. Mm. And when I was running CS Energy in Australia, we had difficulty attracting and retaining the right talent because it was basically a dying industry. Like we were mm. running a portfolio of coal-fired power stations and, and that industry is going to decline over time. So when you're talking about attracting the best and brightest that are coming out of the universities, they don't want to go and learn about you know, the thermal dynamics of a coal-fired boiler. They want to be doing robotics and artificial intelligence. Mm. 
Mm. And so the pool of people was obviously difficult to get coming out of the universities. And it's an industry where you do need to grow people from the ground up. There's a lot of knowledge required uh, in those technical roles. So what we did was to capture the essence of what our company offered in our, what we call the employee value proposition. What is it that we offer to employees? And we went through a process which was um, quite uh, structured. We interviewed a whole bunch of people who were in the company. And then we interviewed a bunch of people who were applying for jobs. And as candidates, knowing almost nothing about the company, we'd interview them about what they thought and what they thought the company was. And then we'd interview them at periodic intervals, after interview, after job acceptance, and then you know three to six months in. So we could see how their perceptions of the business changed over time. That enabled us to put together a statement basically of what the company offered and people could work out pretty quickly whether that was somewhere they wanted to be or not. Now I've got to tell you, Petra, people weren't banging down our doors like they do to work for Google. But there are some brands that are always going to attract, you know, mm. like top, top candidates because the brand demands that. Um, if Google set up uh, a head office in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, one of the most war-torn countries on the planet, they would attract a bunch of the top graduates to go there. Right? They would. Um, but, but, you know, CS Energy, probably not so much. So being realistic about what it is that you offer and being clear about that so that there aren't any surprises is really important in terms of the psychological contract and your ability to retain the people that you hire. Uh, so we spent a lot of time and energy thinking about that and, and obviously describing that in a way that was useful to people who were thinking about potentially working for us. Mm. So what I hear from what you were saying is that for your personal brand, for your company brand, it all comes down to standing out. In order to stand out, you need to know what you stand for. And then by creating content and a presence and a profile around that your value proposition, you either attract or repel people to you or away from you. Yeah, that, absolutely. And, and you know, let, let's face it, I'm not everyone's cup of tea. I mm. know that, um, you know. And, um, you know, Emma and I always laugh. The, the first time we knew we were going to be successful was when we got trolled for the first time <laughs> on social media. Um, someone, someone just let rip with a one-star review on the podcast. Like we had, yeah, the podcast is hundreds and hundreds of reviews globally. It's a, it's a five-star rated podcast. And we got this one-star rating where someone just hooked into us. And I couldn't wait to get on the phone to Emma. I was still in Australia at this stage. Couldn't wait to get on the phone to Emma to say, we've made it someone's actually trolled us it means we've actually gone hard enough that someone has really disliked something we've said and that means we're right on track absolutely um it's uh, what's the saying um yeah you can't be everyone's darling and this also shows that you've got a strong brand because if you are nice you are also blending in and the only way how to not get any criticism is by just saying nothing and even then People say you're a wallflower and don't have an opinion. So we can't get it right anyway. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. And it's also really important to understand market segmentation as well, because mm. um, brand on its own is, is sort of a, a great concept to think about. For most of us, it doesn't carry the same monetary value that will for the big players and the big brands um, in terms of uh, brand recognition. But in terms of your ability to find the right target market that you're actually um, trying to pursue, Super, super important. So we thought very, very carefully, and when I say thought, I mean, we, we did a lot of work before we opened our doors for business back in 2018. Emma and I did a lot of work on who our ideal customer was, what the right target market was, how we were going to get to that market, and who um, the content that I was actually going to put out there would resonate with and help the most. And so we had a very, very clear picture in our mind of who our, our target market is, and who it isn't. And of course, we get people from you know, all, all ranges of the spectrum, but by the same token, we had this real clarity about what our sweet spot was. And so that was the key thing in making sure that the brand aligned with the target market that we thought we were going to reach. Um, and I think looking back on it now, three plus years later, we, we can absolutely say that our initial planning and uh, uh, concept of the target market we were going to have has played out exactly as we'd anticipated. Now, I can't say that about everything in the business, but, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> just in terms of market segmentation and brand, it's turned out exactly the way we thought it would. 
Mm, excellent. And you've only been in business for three and a bit years and you've yeah. seen such a massive growth and success story, which obviously shows that people from all over the world and from different cultures resonate with your message. And one really important aspect that you mentioned is that you were very clear on what and who you want to attract and who your message isn't for, because so many are afraid of um, being too niche or being too special. Whereas at the same time, leadership is a very broad concept and a topic yeah. and it doesn't mean much if you don't specify it um how did you come to this conclusion who is your ideal audience um well i think we worked out what the pain point was mm. and i think um in order to come up with a solution you need to understand the problem quite well so what was the problem with leadership why is it that you know i think somewhere in the vicinity of 400 billion US dollars is spent on leadership development every year globally, yet patently uh, leadership is in a fairly parlous state. If you look at you know, the tops of some of the organizations and of course areas like politics, uh, leadership is, is very, very hard to come by in terms of good leadership. As I like to say, I've worked with hundreds of highly capable, intelligent, experienced, smart people over my career but I can count the number of great leaders I've worked with on one hand and I, I don't need all my fingers. So, so I think the distinction between good, capable business people and great leaders is a distinction we sort of have to think about. Um, yeah, so, so look, in terms, of, in terms of the target audience, you know, we, we're sort of thinking the people who most benefit from this are people who have some leadership experience. Now, of course, we get aspiring leaders and all sorts listening to the podcast and doing our uh, online program, but people who have got enough experience to realize that leadership isn't as easy as it looks. When, you, when you're 25, everything looks easy. You know, I'm going to be a millionaire. I'm going to be retired by the time I'm 35. Uh, I'll lead this fantastic team of people. It's all going to fall into place. And then you get a few years under your belt and you go, ah, oh, shit, this is a bit harder than I thought. And so you sort of reevaluate. And that's when you start looking for answers that aren't what you're doing now, because obviously people work out pretty quickly. Yeah, if I keep doing this, this hurts. <laughs> and it's not getting the results I want. So, so maybe I should look at doing something different. So we want to hit people right there where they've got enough experience. So we're sort of talking mid-career leaders through to the C-suite. And I firmly believe, even though a number of CEOs and executives in large organizations might think that this is uh, beneath them mm -hmm. to be still working on their leadership at this point in their careers, I can tell you a few that could well use it, Petra. <laughs> in, my, in my experience, uh, I could send you a few too, <laughs> because I couldn't. <laughs> okay. we, I couldn't. Got, I mean, every everyone who's listening to this podcast episode has a name in their head right now about someone who could them. use it. <laughs> <laughs> to be honest, I can only think of one person who was really an inspiring leader. I didn't report directly to him, but two levels up. But that was the only person I still remember in a positive way. Everyone right. else, I just either didn't respect <laughs> to start with, or it was just a failure from the start. Yeah. I, I mean, I mean, which is uh, which is incredibly sad, right? Mm. I mean, we can we can laugh about it, but it's incredibly sad because leaders have so much influence over people's lives, the people they mm. lead, and it affects everything in that in that person's life. Um, you know, it affects their mood, it affects their confidence, it affects their um, ability to be successful, it affects their career path, it even affects their relationships outside of work. So leaders have an enormous responsibility. I think a lot of leaders just simply operate in benign neglect. They just don't take that duty of care seriously enough. Um, and if, if you were to take that duty of care seriously enough, then maybe you'd put aside your own fears and apprehensions and anxieties and do what the person you're leading needs as opposed to what makes you feel comfortable. Mm, absolutely. And so many still think or glorify a leadership role as this, you know, the status and the symbol and the respect that you get. But it's a lot more difficult than that. And I think it's now more difficult than ever before. And moving or looking into another year, two or five years ahead from now, it's another level because now we've got five generations in the workforce, which makes yeah. it hard. We see a lot more global teams which means 24-7 operations with different backgrounds in terms of culture, quicker technology. When we look ahead in the next 12 months, where would you focus with um, your clients and your students on in terms of skill development um, and also value creation? What's, what's your tips in that aspect? 
Well, I think, as, as I said earlier, Petra, I don't think leadership has changed much. Mm. I think if we, if we as leaders try and get back to basics, back to the fundamentals that really make a difference, deliver value, handle conflict, build your own resilience, work at the right level, don't micromanage, don't do other people's jobs for them, learn how to master ambiguity, make great decisions and drive accountability. Right? Accountability is the key to successful execution. And uh, unless you can really drive an accountability model through your team, then you'll get this all care, no responsibility crap and you'll get whatever you get. Oh, so it's, it's those, it's those, those, those core fundamentals are just disciplines that can be worked on. Anyone can learn them, anyone can improve them. Mm. And I think this approach is more needed than ever before. So I'm really looking forward to seeing what's next for you. Now, you moved to the US from Australia and you recently uh, launched your book and it's now a bestseller. What's next for you? I have seen quite a lot of keynotes are on the cards, but what's in for 2022 and beyond for Marty Moore? Well, good question, Petra. Uh, 2022 is the um, expansion year. So I'm over here in the US expanding the business here. I think uh, once again, in terms of having impact on more people, uh, Australia is a wonderful, wonderful country and I'll no doubt return there. There's no doubt about it. <laughs> but at the moment, I think um, being in the bigger market and being close to Europe, of course, is really important. And uh, this is why we decided to publish the book exclusively in the US. Although, uh, funnily enough, I can actually let you know hot off the presses. I just signed an agreement uh, today with my agent to have the book published in Italy, translated into Italian. So wow. that's good. So, yes. uh, so that's a bit of fun. And I got some great advice early on that said, if you ever want the book to go anywhere outside of Australia, you can't publish it here. It's got to be, got to be done overseas. So, um, so I think really um, uh, capitalising on the momentum of the book launch and making sure that we can just get this book into as many leaders' hands as possible. Um, for all sorts of reasons, obviously. <laughs> we, we, that, hey, we've got, a, we've got a great purpose, but we're not in this for love of the sport, Petra. We are running a business. Exactly. Um, and, uh, and obviously that leads into the opportunities in uh, speaking. So I've signed an agreement with, uh, an exclusive agreement actually with one of uh, the US's top speaker bureaus, um, American Program Bureau, APB. They're wonderful. Uh, I've already done some work for them in the last uh, few months. Uh, and they're just a fantastic um, organisation to work with. Uh, so there'll be a lot more of that this year as the conferences come back. But as you can see in my virtual studio, I can do a lot of virtual keynotes as well, which is fabulous. And uh, with, um, I don't know if you people can see this, but um, if you've got the video running, you know, with the, the, marvels of, <laughs> the marvels of software. So talking about branding, right? So this is the, <laughs> the Martin D. Moore branding. And I can actually give, you know, very, um, uh, very professional keynotes, um, you know, without having to leave the comfort of my own studio, which is fantastic. So you can see how effective this is in terms of being able to um, communicate a message, even though it's over virtual, um, virtual means. So yeah, so there'll be a lot more of that this year. A uh, little bit of consulting, but we're gonna do a lot more content development this year. Um, I think we've got um, really good, strong momentum in the products we've got out there now. And so this gives us an opportunity to really develop our content to get more content in a more leader's hands. Oh, excellent. And I can't wait to spread your message also, because as I said to, uh, very early, you are leading by example in so many different aspects. And I think sometimes we just need to see somebody else doing it to step into those shoes. And this is exactly what leadership is all about, going before somebody else tells you, taking the risk, taking the negative comments every now and then, but stepping up for the greater good. So Thank you so much for your insights. I'll make sure to add all the links where people can find you and connect with you in the show notes. Is there a particular um, website or um, a social media platform where you spend your most time? Uh, yeah, so, um, so sorry for my, if people want to find out more about me, or exactly. is there a social media platform? Okay, so um, at, at Martin G. Moore on social media, um, martingmore.com. Uh, and then, of course, our uh, corporate brand in Australia is yourceomentor.com. So um, everything, everything, you need to, everything you need to know is on those. Awesome. And I'll, as a, by the way, I love your branding. It's very consistent and you stand out straight away. You know exactly that's the message that's uh, Marty behind it and it's your mentor brand. It's everywhere. It's, it's awesome. I love it. <laughs> well, thank, thank you, Petra. I really appreciate that. But you can thank my daughter, Emma Green, for that. She runs the business. She's the chief executive. And she handles all of that stuff. And she's done such a 
a wonderful job in getting that brand consistency all the way through. Absolutely. And we'll also have Emma on the show to talk about exactly that, how she went about it and also work with you on building your personal brand to be the talent in the organization whilst running all the operations in the background. So I'm looking forward to this conversation too. <laughs> excellent. Excellent. Thank you so much. And um, yeah, looking forward to seeing what's in store for you for 2022. Thank you so much, Petra. Great to have, great to join you. Thank you. Thank you.